Hello and welcome back. I come to you once again from the absolutely beautiful timberlands of Oaxaca, Mexico. And today I want to talk to you about a potential doom loop that your forest land might be stuck in. So if we're being honest, there's currently a lot of forest land across the United States and Canada that is currently producing very low quality timber. And there's a lot of reasons for this. In some cases, it was high graded in the past, meaning they took the best and left the rest. And the only thing left to grow and reproduce was poor value, poor quality species and individuals. Um, in other cases, maybe it's a relatively poor quality site in between two fertile patches of agricultural land, which is especially common across America's heartland and so on. And so if you own land like this, it's very possible that you are stuck in a doom loop. Um, and that means that maybe you've looked at having a timber harvest in the past or engaging in some sort of forest management practice, and you've just decided that the returns are too low. There wouldn't be enough money coming in from that harvest to justify any action. So maybe you've decided, for example, that the aesthetics of leaving the timber standing is better than any money you'd receive from a harvest. And that's a perfectly legitimate value judgment. The problem is that it casts your land into a sort of doom loop that ensures that it will continue to produce very low value into the future. Now in the interest of not being dramatic, it isn't a true negative feedback loop. Uh, there's nothing that will make it worse off necessarily. And you know, forests are very dynamic. They're changing over time. There's ecological succession. So it's possible that with enough time it will produce value again. But it, I can promise you it will take a very long time. So for all intents and purposes, whatever it's producing now, which could be nothing, is what it will continue to produce into the foreseeable future. And so while I might call this a doom loop, economists might call it a sunk cost fallacy. It's a woulda, coulda, shoulda situation. And there's actually a saying that's fairly common, I'm sure you've heard it before, uh, that has nothing to do with forestry, but it's extremely relevant both figuratively and literally. And that saying is, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And that's exactly the problem. You can't change what happened in the past. The value of the current standing timber is a reflection of past activities. It's what happened maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. There's absolutely nothing that you can do individually to change that. All you can do is focus on the future, the potential value of your forest, what your forest could potentially produce. So that's how you break out of the cycle. You have to stop focusing on the past, which is to say present value, and start focusing on the future, the potential value. So to help break out of this cycle and to figure out how to move forward, let's kind of talk about two different situations, two categories of people and problems. Now, the first is somebody who's looked at a timber harvest and just decided that anything they would get in their pocket would not exceed the aesthetic value of the standing forest. And I totally understand this. I mean, I myself basically would not want to do something like a clear cut or a heavy harvest unless I absolutely had no choice. And um, that is why I manage the forest the way I do. So I totally get it. But you have to understand that aesthetics are a fixed value. They're not going to appreciate. When it comes to aesthetics, you know, maybe, well, Maybe like very, very large trees like you see in the Pacific Northwest, yeah, they probably have a slightly higher value, certainly. But generally speaking, as long as it's closed canopy and the trees are relatively tall, uh, the aesthetic value of a standing forest is essentially equal, or any appreciation is going to be fairly minuscule. Timber, on the other hand, is going to be a productive asset. It's going to continue to produce value basically for all eternity, or at least, you know, as long as life persists on this earth and there are humans that have the consciousness to perceive value. So while it is important to retain that aesthetic value, it's best to find a way to improve the production of timber while also preserving those aesthetic values. And there are plenty of ways to do this. Let's look at the worst case scenario. Maybe you have basically nothing on your land that's worthwhile. It's all trash, it's all junk. It's um, basically firewood and that's all it can ever be. Well, if that's the case, there is a type of harvest called a seed tree. And this is when if you even have five trees per acre, maybe even two, maybe worst case scenario, one of uh, a high quality, potentially valuable tree that's wind firm and strong and has a good crown, good seed production, then you cut everything but those trees and those trees can persist to produce seed and thus uh, create a much 
higher quality stand composition for the next generation. Now this is something that's very viable in a lot of the eastern and northeastern United States. In southern New England, maybe going into New York and Pennsylvania, for example, it's very common to have scattered white pine in the forest. And white pine is perfect for this sort of situation. White pine is long-lived. It grows taller than everything else most of the time. So it usually has a very good crown. Uh, it's wind firm. It's used to kind of being out on its own and exposed to those forces. And it's a pretty good producer of seed. So if you have a few white pines scattered around, those can be the basis for a great seed tree harvest. The same holds true in some of the hardwood areas across Appalachia and into the Midwest a little bit, where you have species like sugar maple that are very long-lived, and if they have good crowns, um, then they can serve as these seed trees and help to spread seed to ensure that the composition of the next generation is much higher quality. Now the great thing about a seed tree harvest is that while it's still a heavy harvest, it's getting rid of the trees that need to be gotten rid of, it still has a strong aesthetic component. I love seed trees. It's really beautiful sometimes to just see these lone massive trees standing out in the middle of an otherwise open field. And yes, for the first few years, you know, there's a lot of brown, there's a lot of dead sticks and foliage and things you generally don't want to see, but it doesn't take very long until it's regenerated again. And it kind of goes through these stages of kind of looking like a meadow and it has a very unique feel to it that in my opinion and for me is extremely aesthetic. Now, if you're not quite that far off and you just have kind of a slight problem with value in your standing timber, for example, maybe it's only 30% acceptable growing stock, as we'd say, which is to say valuable species that we want to persist and reproduce into the future. So if this is your situation, and actually uh, this is applicable to me in my land, I have a stand that fits this criteria, maybe what you want to do is an improvement cut or a very light selection cut. And what this would be is you're going in and maybe removing 30% of volume if you can, if you can find some small equipment to do this, and you know, just cut that out for pulpwood if you can find the market, or firewood, um, something of that nature. And I know that can be difficult depending on your markets, but that's the best case scenario. And once you remove this value, this opens up the space for the higher quality species. They can either reproduce or their crowns can grow out, and those higher value species can put on more growth. Now this sort of system would fall under what would be called continuous cover forestry. It's harvesting the trees over time, but not in a way that does anything to diminish the overall cover of the forest. So it's like the forest was never even touched. The aesthetics were essentially unchanged as long as the, you know, the harvest was conducted properly, but the value was enhanced dramatically. So you retained those aesthetic values and you've prevented any sort of loss of potential value going into the future from the timber production. So that's the best course of action if the problem is really aesthetics versus uh, timber. Now let's talk about if you're in a situation where it's, it's just really bad. Maybe you can't find anybody to cut the land. Maybe you'd actually have to pay and do some timber stand improvement activities to actually get it to produce anything valuable. And that really is the worst case scenario. Well, here's the good news, and this is also applicable to the last group. There are no 911s in forestry. And yeah, of course, the sooner you act, the better. But generally speaking, forest and forest growth, is, it's a very slow process, it's a slow industry. Nothing is changing super quickly. So you can improve things slowly over time. Over the course of a decade, you can do things here and there. You know, for example, I have a video of doing an herbicide stem injection in one of my stands to help rid the stand of American beech, which is diseased and uh, creates a lot of problems in the northeastern United States. Or maybe you can do something like the improvement cut selection type system, like I described previously, but you can just do it very slowly. Maybe you can just go in and cut a few cords of firewood for personal use over time. Maybe you're in a good location so you can actually sell some of that firewood. Um, whatever the situation is, you can just kind of go in and do it over a long period of time. And actually the best forests I've ever seen in my life have been stands that have been managed exactly like this. I used to have a coworker and he, um, had a home he built next to a very nice wood lot. And I think, oh, he must have owned it for 30 years or so. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But he had done a lot of work to that, that stand of wood. And he actually worked on his land with a snowmobile. Every winter, he would cut some trees, haul them out with a little snowmobile and a chain. And um, he would either sell the trees or, I, I can't actually remember, he might have had a sawmill. Um, but he's, he somehow found a way to use the wood, either market it or use it himself. 
And his forest was just amazing. It was one of the most beautifully managed forests I have ever seen in my life. And since then, I've seen a couple other examples of people just kind of picking away over time. And, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, as they say, and forests certainly aren't grown in a day either. They take decades to grow. And so why not do work over the course of decades? Now, if you're super picky about return on investment and finance, maybe you'd say like, well, you know, the cost of trying to improve that land wouldn't be worth the return you'd get. And that's not inaccurate. Um, it's hard to say that for sure until you know the exact situation. But this is why I love Timberland investment personally. Uh, it's, it's something that's financially rewarding, but also it's personally rewarding. I personally love doing work on my land. It's, it's a serious financial thing for me, but it's also a hobby. And it's very personal rewarding to see that as well. And if, if you're watching this video, then there's a high probability that maybe you fall into that category. You just like working outside. You know, kind of like the guys that like mowing their lawn. I hate mowing my lawn. Some guys love it. I don't understand it. It's whatever. I love working in my woods, and you probably do too. So why not just over the course of many years do some timber stand improvement activities on your own? Uh, maybe you do five acres a year, and over the course of a decade, that's 50 acres that have been meticulously managed by you. That's amazing. That can do a lot over a long period of time. And then the problem is maybe you produce like a super high value stand of wood and that even though the stand's valuable, you, you then fall into group A because then um, it's not just about the aesthetics, it's about some sort of other uh, personal enjoyment you get from just seeing the tree standing. And um, I don't know, I guess rewatch the video if, if uh, you find yourself in 10 years falling back into group A. I don't know. And you know, ultimately this is the beauty of forestry. There's no right or wrong way to do things. There's no way that's you know, serious forestry versus not serious forestry. It's all forestry and that's all that really matters. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently in Oaxaca, Mexico once again, and I'm here in a community managed forest. So this is owned by the community of, I think I'm so bad for remembering the names here, but Santa Maria Ixtepec, I think. And they've kind of created a um, ecotourism park that's also a managed forest. So I drove up here on my motorcycle and there's log trucks going down and I can hear in some areas the sound of chainsaws around me and you would you would never guess and and if you spent too much time like myself in the northern Maine forest industry then maybe you look at some of the stuff going on here and you say like oh this is like this is silly this is a joke this is not profitable but this is how people make their living here right um, there's no right or wrong way to do something forestry no matter where you are no matter what your situation is it's just about finding a unique solution to an always unique set of problems. And so here they have a unique set of problems and so they have a unique set of solutions. In Northern Maine, same way. West Virginia, same. That's all it is, that's always what it has been. But it is important that you kind of know what you're doing. Um, so if you're watching this video, if this speaks to you, if you feel like now you wanna go out to your forest and do something, I highly suggest you download my book and I'm going to leave a link in the description and you can download my totally free ebook, How to Read Your Forest. And in it, I describe silvicultural treatment, some of which I talked about here, like uh, the seed tree harvest and shelterwood harvest, etc. And I also talk about core forestry principles, how to manage a land for the best value. So I highly suggest that you visit that link in the description and in the comments and go download my book and start reading it so you can get started as soon as possible managing your forest. All right, guys, that's all for now. The sun is setting. I am in the middle of nowhere. I have to go find my motorcycle before it gets too much darker. So, later.